Part of the problem about cosmology and, for example, astrophysics is exactly this distinction between the forest and the trees. We're really going to be talking about the forest and some of the issues like life on Earth, the future of the sun, etc., etc., is really about the trees. And um, it's a bit difficult sometimes to actually understand the vastness of the scales we're talking about. So let me start by setting that scene. It's more abstract, but it's exactly a question of scale. Um, so this is an example of where you start. We we're kind of very worried about what happens, our little problems in, these, in a tiny island called Tenerife, in a tiny planet called the Earth, in a tiny solar system, which is ours. And look at this thing, it always appears here, objects not to scale, okay? Every of these, all of these pictures which talk about the solar system, in a way you have to do something about perspective, otherwise you have no idea. You have absolutely no idea. Um, this would be mainly empty. So most of the universe is actually empty space, and the things we talk about are really too small. And the problem is that even this is just a micro detail. It's something which is completely irrelevant. On the scale of the things, we're interested in cosmology. You really want to go bigger, and if you go, so this is one solar system, which is tiny, it's going to be a tiny thing in one of these arms of a galaxy with trillions of stars, some of them like us, some of them very different from us. And even this is not cosmology, this is astrophysics. What we talk about cosmology is when you go a bit beyond this again, and for example, you zoom out, each of these points is a galaxy, and essentially when you talk about cosmology, what you talk about is something called the cosmological fluid. So what we're talking about is a fluid, is a liquid, so to speak, not really a liquid, but let's call it a fluid, um, in which the molecules are the galaxies. And what you want to know is the general behavior of this thing when you discuss cosmology. So very different scale, okay, very different perspective, and of course some of the questions that have been the issue of these debates are really going to be seen in a very different level. Because of course, who cares about the time scale and the length scale of the solar system when, when we talk about the universe, this is the kind of huge scale we, we're talking about. So more abstract, not necessarily very popular if you want to know about biology and life in the universe and everything. Um, really, there is a perspective error. When you look at the sky, what you see is a few thousand stars. So even the beautiful night, night time here, in which you can see the stars very nicely, you go to the desert in Australia, you can see this, lots of stars in the sky. That's a minor thing, really. It's a few thousand stars compared to trillions in a galaxy and compared with the fact that even the galaxy is irrelevant on the scale we're talking about. And the perspective error you get here is that it looks like this thing isn't changing very much on the scale which is the scale of observations and the scale which is like the scale we can see. And the first person to realize this was this guy, very important person, Mont Palomar, observations by Edwin Hubble. And finally it was understood that the example I like to give is that we had been watching the film one millimeter from the screen. So imagine you go to the cinema and you decide instead of sitting where you are to watch a film, you go like one millimeter from the screen, clearly you don't see the plot. The plot is completely wrong, you miss the plot completely. And in fact, what looks like in the sky to be not a very large universe and essentially very static, once you have this zooming out process, which was what Hubble did, becomes something completely different, becomes an expanding universe. So not only is the universe much larger, but it looks like it's moving, it's not static, it's expanding. And this is relevant about this issue about the future and the past of the universe, why? Because the universe seems to be expanding according to something called the Hubble law, which means something which is further out is moving faster. The further something is from you, the faster it is. And if you think a bit about what this means, it means if you rewind the film back in time, everything was together in one point. So anything satisfying a Hubble law in which the velocity of recession is proportional to the distance has this property that if you backtrack and you extrapolate to the beginning, it means everything was in one point at some stage in the past, which means there's a beginning in the universe. Which means, well, you can actually work out the time, and this means some 14 billion years ago. So this is the kind of time scale and space scale we're talking about when you discuss cosmology, when you discuss issues like what's the future of life, what's the future of the universe, it really is on a scale very different, both in space and time, than that one you discuss in biology, for example, and even in things like astrophysics. So that's the first thing I want you to tell you, to set the stage, to make sure we know we're talking about the same things. So this is more abstract, obviously. 
who cares about pollution, who cares about ecology here, but of course this is a very different level, it's kind of cosmic ecology if you want. And then, um, second thing I want to tell you, which is important, is that there's of course two sides of this story in cosmology, one theory, one observation. And I showed you that beautiful picture, which is a real picture of the universe with lots of galaxies. In fact, what happens is, um, if you go back in time, because the universe is expanding, it's getting more diluted, if you go back in time, it's more concentrated, which means it's more hot, it's hotter. And the radiation in particular, which goes around the universe, was a lot hotter in the past than what it is now. So this means something quite interesting. So on one hand, we have this kind of time machine in a way, we are better than archaeologists, as cosmologists. If you want to see the past, you look far away, because you're looking at things as they were in the past. Okay? But at some point, the game goes wrong, and it goes wrong exactly when the radiation around the universe becomes hot enough to couple to matter, and then the universe becomes opaque. So in other words, you have a transparent universe. You can work out exactly when this happens. You have a transparent universe until the 400 years or so after the Big Bang, but before that, it's opaque, which by definition means we have this nice time machine, but it breaks down at this time. So we have direct access to the universe, which is a picture of the universe at this time. Very beautiful picture, you probably have seen it. Be careful, the contrast button is turned on a lot. The universe is actually very homogeneous. What actually happens is there's these fluctuations, hot and cold. Each of these things would contain trillions of galaxies later on, okay? But these things, hot and cold, are actually a part in 100,000. So they're very, very small variations. These are the baby galaxies, so to speak, the baby fluctuations that later on become what we see. So very important structure here we have, but the problem is every time we see anything like this, and I'm sure Lisa is going to show you these examples, so there's a lot of stuff, speculation about what happens before this picture called the cosmic microwave background, which I showed you before. So we see all these universes expanding, we don't know exactly what happens, galaxies, we're accelerating, maybe there's dark energy, there's dark matter, etc. And then there's a whole lot of us, a lot of theorists, who work about the beginning of the universe in the hope of explaining all of this mess out of very simple things back here. This is all theory, right? So there's fact and fantasy. Anything which goes all the way down to the cosmic microwave background is a fact, everything afterwards is a fantasy. And this is, a, I think, a good picture about what happens with theories that work. Everyone has a different view about what happens, and I'm sure we will have a discussion along these lines. We really don't know. So there's going to be a lot of speculations discussed here about what is the beginning of the universe. The point is, before the microwave background was emitted, it's all speculation. And when I told you there's a big bang right at the beginning of the universe, even that is a speculation. Because we are actually, of course, extrapolating to a level we cannot really have direct access to, and this is a big extrapolation, obviously. So just because of that, let me just um, point these various things. I mean, we're going to be talking about things. I have worked on all these things, so I can actually be negative about them. There's a lot of mainstream cosmology. For example, there are things, the Big Bang theory explains a lot, but we talk about dark matter. Why? Because without dark matter, gravity doesn't work properly. The universe is accelerating, that could be dark energy, why? Because otherwise the universe would not be accelerating. Could all of these just mean we don't know what we're talking about? Very important point, not only do we not have access to this early stage of the universe, but we're making a statement which could be completely wrong, just because we're assuming the theory of gravity is right. Something else, there's a very important theory which explains what happened immediately after the Big Bang and generates these tiny fluctuations, it's called inflation. It's very conservative and successful, but could it be too easy to be true? And finally, this is just a, to pass the ball on to Lisa next, extra dimensions, where are you? It's a very nice speculation, it is a speculation. And of course, these are the issues that we should be discussing. There's a lot of mainstream cosmology. It is based not on fact, but on extrapolations based on theory. And this is my favorite quote, Paul Dirac, he actually wrote this during his honeymoon. It's a very strange paper he wrote. I don't know what his wife thought about this. It was on honeymoon and he wrote a paper on, which is a seminal paper on varying constants. I'm gonna read this just because it's so important. One field of work in which there has been too many spe too much speculation is cosmology. There are very few hard facts to go on, but theoretical workers have been busy constructing various models for the universe based on any assumptions that they fancy. It's very English. You know. These models are probably all wrong. Dirac was extremely rude for various reasons. Some of people think he's autistic. I think this is 
painfully true, and the reason is exactly this one. It is usually assumed that the laws of nature have always been the same as they are now. There is no justification for these. The laws may be changing, and in particular quantities, which are considered to be constants of nature, may be varying in cosmological time. Such variations would completely upset the model maker. It's a very nice quote. It basically says that there is a massive extrapolation every time we try to understand cosmology based on the laboratory physics we measure here and now. We're saying this is true all the way back to the beginning of the Big Bang. Clearly, this cannot be true. And one of the questions is whether the laws of nature and the constants of nature have been varying in time. So I don't want to say much more about this. I just, you know, I may, let me just point out I've been involved in one way of turning this on its head and in a way using the variability of the laws of physics and constants to solve problems in cosmology. The universe is broken into these connected horizons if the universe is based on the Big Bang and on relativity theory. The reason is if you have an age, if you have a beginning, a birth time, and if you have a speed limit, the speed of light, when there's a maximum range, things have propagated, could have propagated. Since the Big Bang, this is a problem. It's actually the size of the moon. If you look at this picture, it's about half the size of the moon, the kind of region when you can have contact. Now, this is a complete pain because then you cannot explain why this is so homogeneous. As I told you, this is the contrast button turned on massively. This is actually very small fluctuations. Why? Well, the universe has no right to display this unity because there was nothing in causal contact, in direct contact. And one possibility, which I found always very interesting, is based on this idea, Lev Landau used to say, cosmologists are often wrong, but seldom in doubt. Clearly, there's been too many assumptions here. And one is simply that if you raise the speed limit, i.e. the speed of light, you could solve this problem and start resolving some of the conundrums of the Big Bang theory. So it's very easy to suggest this. Of course, the problem is that all the theories we know are based on the constancy of the speed of light, which is like a big pillar in physics. So this has been something that has taken so many years to develop into a proper theory. My favorite one is the one in which you basically say the different colors of the rainbow has different speeds. But of course, colors here means very, very high frequency. So things very, very close to something, which is called the Planck frequency. So basically, physics beyond the one we test in the laboratory. So why have I been doing this? Well, I'm against bandwagon science. There's a lot of science which is basically people turning, jumping on a bandwagon. And I think some of the things we'll be discussing, like dark matter, inflation, etc., they're not necessarily wrong, but I think there's too many people working on them. So this is a sociological statement. And the statement I want to make is that this is the problem that happens. Bandwagon science means this kind of overcrowding, everyone doing exactly the same with the consequence that no one is actually questioning the possibility that we might have looked in the wrong place. And specifically, there might be a perspective error. I like to think, so this is something you might know, this guy, Fahir Rabin, studied the early papers of Galileo. And when Galileo pointed the first telescope to the sky, no one believed in what he was doing, simply because people were not used to using instruments. And, well, the reason is, of course, a bit like the painting before Brunelleschi was based on a sense of that people, the same way people do not use instruments in science, people were used to a language in which you could see things, you could see the third dimension, simply because you were used to it without perspective. And of course, when Brunelleschi introduced this, people thought this was complete nonsense because they were not used to this language as well. So it's actually, if you start to look at this from the eyes of someone who saw this before, this indeed does not make any sense. It's just a bunch of lines going in this direction. And the reason why I'm saying this is actually that science sometimes has these problems of perspective. So when Galileo first looked at the Jupiter satellites, everyone thought that these things were actually impurities lying in the process of observation. And quite often people could not see things they could see because to observe astronomically using telescopes requires a guidance, a theoretical guidance to the eye. So quite often in science there is this problem, this is back and forth between paradigms, what you assume, what you don't assume, and I think it's very dangerous for us to jump in the same bandwagon all the time because of this. And now I will let my colleague insult me and say this is all wrong. <laughs> <laughs>